Okay, Isaiah 6. We uh, last time uh, got started in chapter 6 and got as far as uh, verse 1. So this week we're doing verse 2. Um, I'm not expecting to get too much beyond that really. Um, but we'll see how we go. Let's, uh, let's just read the, uh, the temple scene again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. So we're looking then at this whole scene, and uh, we noticed last time the uh, specifics with regards to the dating of it with the King Uzziah's death. That King Uzziah is the one who was being trusted in, but who was going to die like any other. And this Lord, this King, this ruler is sitting on a throne. He is high and lifted up, which leads us back to Isaiah 2 and the, the city of Jerusalem being high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filling the temple. And... This week, we're looking specifically at these strange creatures called the seraphim. The seraphim. And um, to say that this week's going to be a bit tricky would be an understatement. I'm going to try and keep it simple, but there's quite a lot here and it's quite complicated. It's quite difficult. And with, with the seraphim, because so little is said in Scripture... A lot of what we rely upon is um, conjecture, um, other documents from the ancient Near East, um, which aren't authoritative, so we, we can't know these things for certain, although we get an idea of how people would have viewed this. And um, so it, it's a tricky thing to navigate. But it's important because when we have this very central theme, this this uh, scene rather, and this uh, picture being painted with the whole of the first five chapters leading up towards it is obviously quite a big deal. And we see here this vision of the throne of God. We see this vision of the throne of God. And here in, in this place, there are these creatures. There are these creatures. And so who or what are the seraphim? Well, the seraphim, as we see them here in the plural, are only mentioned here in Scripture, in Isaiah 6. So, it's very difficult for us to draw too many conclusions. But there are quite a few things we can know about them. The seraphim are typically associated with the cherubim. And we know that the seraphim and cherubim are part of the heavenly host. That much we do know. They're part of the heavenly host. And because they have two different names... Cherubim, seraphim, we tend to think, okay, so you've got the, the cherubim and the seraphim, and these are two different things because they have two different names. We know that they are distinct from the angels. We know that in multiple ways. One of the most obvious ones, and I guess most important ones as we come up to Christmas and we talk about such things, is that we know that angels don't have wings. It is a mythology, nothing more than mythology, that um, this, this picture that people have of angels with wings. It's in fact the cherubim and the seraphim that have wings. Angels don't. Angels are uh, messengers. Literally, the word angel means messenger. They're messengers of God. They interact on behalf of God. Their role is, is representing God, delivering messages, um, going out and doing ministry for him. 
The cherubim and seraphim, on the other hand, are not messengers. They don't go uh, to and fro to give messages or anything like that. Rather, it seems that what we have is uh, creatures who have a very much an identical role, which is that they are guardians of the presence of God. They're guardians of the presence of God. Now, we'll talk more about this in a minute. The first thing I want to deal with is this. Are the cherubim and the seraphim really different? Now, we would immediately, as most people do, presume that they are. Why? Because they have different names. But however, if we're talking about New Testament leadership, when you look in the Bible and you look at the leaders of the church, in some places they're called elders, because those who are young in the faith should not be appointed to such a position. In other parts, they're called bishops because they rule and govern. And in other parts, they're called shepherds because their role in leadership is to shepherd the people. Shepherd is the same word that we, when we use the word pastor. Pastor means shepherd. So you have three separate terms, elders, pastors or shepherds, and bishops. And these are all terms that mostly in our circles we, we come to the conclusion from the use of these three different terms that they are in fact the same thing, the same position, but they emphasize different facets and different aspects of the same position, the same office. So my suggestion to you guys tonight is that the cherubim and the seraphim are actually one and the same beings. It's, it's a tentative conclusion because, like I say, we only have the seraphim, a plural, mentioned here in Isaiah 6, where they have six wings. When we see cherubim elsewhere, they have two wings. And the cherubim seem to have different faces. Um, we see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10 that there's multiple faces and their body has different aspects of different animals. And so my suggestion to you is simply this, that we know that the cherubim are not identical. There are some cherubs that look one way with different faces and different features, and there are other cherubs that look another way. And we know that they're not all uniform in that regard. So it doesn't seem to me to be problematic that when we see these seraphim with six wings, um, that these seraphim are any different than the cherubim, essentially. That they are a, a type of creature that, like us, come in various shapes and sizes. We, we have people who come from different nations and places, and we all look s somewhat the same, and we all look somewhat different. And uh, I suspect it is the same with the cherubim and the seraphim. And if they are, are indeed the same, I think we do have some evidence to support that. Later on in the book of Isaiah, um, let me see if I can find it because I haven't marked it up. Um, in Isaiah 30, um, nope, sorry, wrong passage. Uh, I'm going to find it in a second. Um, that moment when you have too many notes. 37. 37. Um, in Isaiah 37, Hezekiah has uh, a prayer to the Lord. Hezekiah prays to the Lord in uh, Isaiah 37, verse 15. And then in verse 16, it says, O Yahweh of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned... Above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, have made, you have made heaven and earth. And so, uh, we see the throne room of God there, and we see God who's there in heaven, and he is above the cherubim. And here, we have the seraphim above God. And so, we have this picture of these creatures, cherubim and seraphim, very much around the presence of God, covering him protecting not him but protecting the holiness and others from that holiness but we'll talk more about that in a moment so they do very much seem to be in the same place be similar creatures and have the same job which then kind of makes us ask the question why two different names why cherubim and seraphim why not just say the same term well let's go back to our previous example why are um, elders called elders and pastors and bishops is because there's different facets of the same job. The person who is um, 
a leader in the church, has a position of authority, hence the, 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 the general term of, of bishop. Um, and then we have um, the fact that they are to be uh, mature to a degree, they're not to be young in the faith, they're not to be new converts, and so the term there is one which is elder, and they're often referred to as elders, they're the elder ones. And then also um, we have the term uh, pastor because they're supposed to be shepherding. So why in this case, if I'm right, and again I say it's tentative, if I'm right and we have multiple references in scripture to cherubim, why here are these cherubim referred to as seraphim? And I think the answer is simply this. The word seraph means snake or serpent. And we know, and this is where we've got to be careful, some people give too much credence to what's called ancient Near Eastern literature. Some people pay too little. It's, it's um, not to be our, something that we put too much credence in, but it's something we need to observe and take interest in. And that is other texts of the same kind of era, other nations worshipping their false gods who had similar beings that they talked about with regards to their gods. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. Some people will, will draw their arrows saying, oh look, here are these ancient Near Eastern texts where they have these, these serpent creatures and they have these, these um, different aspects of worshipping their gods and somehow the, the, the worshippers of Yahweh have taken that imagery and used it to describe God in a way that those people could understand. I don't believe that at all. The arrows going in the wrong direction. Really what's happened is that we have a description of God, of the heavenly host, of these things that would have been passed down from Adam and Eve right the way through, from generation after generation down. These things were kept orally amongst people until they were written down. And then as people went out and they went away from Yahweh and they left the worship of the true God and they started to worship false gods, it is of course of no surprise to us that they kept elements of Yahweh, of what he was like, of his heavenly host, and they took some of those things with them as they went off to worship in false ways and to worship, worship false gods. And so we know from these ancient Near Eastern texts that other, um, other religions, other nations, would speak of these seraphim, these serpent-like creatures, often with wings, who were fiery serpents fiery serpents and the root meaning of the word serpent there's another word by the way in hebrew that is more common that means serpent this particular word that is less common comes from the root meaning of fire or burning it literally means to burn so these are fiery serpents now i want you to picture this right now okay we have now and I, by the way, I thought Isaiah, uh, not the, the writer here, but Isaiah, who we know from our church, who did our leaflets and our flyers, did a really good job of this when he tried to illustrate it. Not an easy thing to do. But you have these serpent-like creatures with these various wings who were burning, who, if you picture the glory and the brilliance of God, and they are there, as I said, as guardians of the presence of God. Of God. One writer says that they mark the boundary between the sacred and the profane. So you have God in his holiness and he is separated from the things outside his holiness by these creatures. The, these, the, uh, the common angels would be toing and froing. They would go and down to earth and do things on behalf of God. They were his ministers and his messengers. But these creatures were simply there around the glory of God. Now, were they protecting God's holiness for, from contamination? In a sense, yes, that was kind of their role. But what is interesting is how do we associate these creatures? Because it's very interesting that in the ancient Near Eastern literature of that time, these creatures were not seen as friendly, fluffy characters. They were not something you would want to run into. They were viewed very negatively. They were viewed as warriors, as 
um, those who were perhaps something not unlike an angel of death. But if you were welcome in the presence of God, then they were a blessing to you because they protected you from being in that rightful place. And they kept anything out that would contaminate that holy place. But if you weren't supposed to be in that holy place, then they were not a blessing to you. They were a curse to you because you're the thing that they are protecting the holiness from. Now, it's very important that we get this whole picture of your cherubim and seraphim. And like I said, I think they're all the same creature. I think the seraphim in particular are a type of cherubim that rather than having multiple faces are serpent-like in their form. And it's interesting to me that the term serpent in the singular, so seraph, that fiery serpent is mentioned in several places in, um, in the Bible uh, as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, and uh, I will actually turn to the Deuteronomy passage because it would, well, then we can't turn to all of these, it would just take too long. But in, in Deuteronomy 8, it talks about how God took Israel through the wilderness and protected them from the fiery serpents that were in the wilderness. And in particular, that seems to be making reference to Numbers 21 and verse 6, which is a very important passage, Numbers 21, something that John picks up on in his Gospel. But uh, when they're in the wilderness, again, they're complaining to Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. <laughs> I can't, I can't um, uh, skim over that without noting. There's no food. There's no water. And we don't like this food. What food is that? I thought there was no food. You see the, the irrationality of complaining to God, the emotion that's tied up in that. Um, so, uh, the Lord, because of this complaining, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And you'll know the story, I hope, and the people ask for, to repent and for God to take this away from them. And, uh, and, uh, Moses prays for the people and the Lord says to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it will live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. What do you picture when you hear, when you hear that story? What do you picture? I just picture a camp where there's a bunch of little snakes like little rattlers coming in. That's how I've always pictured it. The rattlers come in and they bite you because that's what snakes do. They'll bite and these people get poisoned by the snakes. Is it possible that these are seraphim? That these are angelic beings? I'm not sure that they are because the seraphim protect the presence of God. But it's the same word used. And it's interesting to me that if at the very least, if, if these are literal snakes coming into the camp, if they are, and I, again, tentatively I think they are, then what it's saying is that these creatures in heaven look somewhat like that. They look somewhat like that. And the only problem that we have, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting, is that the serpents in heaven that they're being compared to have six wings and two of them cover their face and two of them are flying and two of them cover their feet, the lower part of their body. I don't know too many serpents with feet, perhaps they did in those times and perhaps we don't now. There's another serpent that you know about, isn't there? We're going to be going there at some point. So the whole thing opens up this entire fascinating world that we really don't know that much about and these cherubim uh, the cherubim are uh, spoken of more often, and again, they have this similar role, the guardianship of the presence of God, and there is this, this role that they have as God's... One friend of mine, when I was talking to him about this, he used the term mercenary. I kind of like that, that they're God's mercenaries, that they're there. And that's why I kind of half wonder 
whether there is some sort of angelic component in the Numbers 21 passage. I think they're probably snakes. I think it's probably some sort of representation in that the snakes are doing the work of dealing with the unholy ones that are contaminating God, God's name because of the sin of Israel. They're contaminating in the way that the, the angelic hosts do, rather than them literally being there. But either way, that connection is very much there, and that's very much interesting. Um, and so, I hope now you've got a different picture in your head. You've got snake-like creatures of some sort that have wings that are scary. They are burning, fiery, presence of God, scary creatures. Now, we'll deal with this more as we come to it in the next couple of weeks. But, if you just, for now, briefly skip ahead to verse 6, Isaiah, who's just said, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. What are the seraphim doing with their lips? Holy 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 god is holy they can be in that holy place with the holy god and isaiah all his lips can do say is i my lips are unclean they can't say holy holy i'm not fit to be here he shouldn't be in that place who protects the holy place the seraphim and so if you're isaiah and you're saying there's lots of ways of paraphrasing woe is me into contemporary English and many of them aren't suitable for in church in a sermon. But let me, let me just try and maybe paraphrase it in a, in a sort of comparative way but that's a bit more accessible to our ears. Isaiah is essentially saying, uh-oh, this, this is like, I know what's coming here. I shouldn't be in this. What, what am I doing here? And then in verse 6, you see a seraphim approaching you with a burning coal. You know what that coal's going to do to you, and it ain't good. You, Isaiah, are the problem. You should not be there. So when we come to verse 6, and of course, we're so familiar with this text that we kind of miss the point. But, but when we come to verse 6, and the coals actually clean him, it's a complete twist. It's a twist that is as dramatic as anything in any Hollywood movie. It's a twist that is totally the opposite of what is expected by the reader in that context. These are the ones who protect the dwelling place of God. Okay, so there we are. We have these burning, fiery serpents. They are there in that form. There are other flying beings of a similar sort. Whether you think of the cherubim and seraphim as separate or elements of the same thing, they all are guardians of the holiness and the presence of God. And, uh, and uh, here they are in this text doing that by the way let me just as before we move on from the notion of burning in the seraphim one more thing to note i want you to see how this fits into the the theme of isaiah in isaiah 1 and i would like you to just briefly turn there in isaiah 1 as he and chapter 1 was so do, I hope you remember, I took a lot of time over chapter one. I think I spent five or six weeks in the first chapter, which most people wouldn't do. But it's very important that we got to see all of these things. And here in Isaiah chapter one, in verse seven, with this initial judgment, this initial statement of the state of Israel, we're told in verse seven, your country lies desolate and your cities are burned with fire. The cities are burned with fire. So fire is a picture of destruction that leads to desolation. Now back into chapter 6, we have these fiery serpents. And in verse 11, when the message goes out from Isaiah, and he is sent from this place after his contact with this fire, in verse 11, he is, says, how long am I going to preach to these people and then not hear? And God says, until cities lie waste without inhabitant, Houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. That's no coincidence. The link between fire and desolation in the judgment of verse 7 is the same in chapter 6. We are to see the burning cities in chapter 1, the fire coming and destroying and burning them and leaving them desolate as God's physical judgment on Israel. In the same way in chapter 6, 
we are to see these fiery seraphim have passed their fire to Isaiah who goes to preach and the people don't hear or understand his preaching. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. And they don't hear or understand his preaching and it leads them to a place of what? Desolation. It's judgment upon them. That's that parallel that we'll pick up again later in chapter 6. But that's interesting to note for now. So, whew, seraphim, there's a lot there, isn't there? It's about to get, if you think that bit's weird, it's about to get even weirder. Let's see what happens. So the seraphim are above, above God. Now, I don't think that's distinct from we saw, uh, I just read to you from Isaiah 37, the cherubim, God was above the cherubim. I think the idea is that they are sort of covering him and surrounding him in a, in a totality. I don't see that as cherubims below and seraphim above or anything like that. They're, they're there in the presence of God. So they are, um, let me read verse 2, um, above him stood the seraphim. I just want to make note of that. Where's the temple? Chapter 2, high and lifted up. Who is God? He is the, who's the one on the throne, rather? He is the one who is high and lifted up, okay? I think it's noticeable here that the seraphim, these cherubim-type creatures in a serpent form, are, are stated as being above God in this text here. That's interesting, because all the reference to high lifted up, high and lifted up, and now we're told that something is above God. I think there's a purpose to that, and I think Isaiah is about to point us to another passage. I think in verse 2, there is an allusion to another Old Testament passage that is equally well known, if not more so. So, we have them above him, and here they are, each have six wings. So, with two they cover their face, with two they cover their feet, and with two they flew. So two of the wings, let's go from the back, two of the wings are flying. They're flying with their wings in a sense of holding position. They're above God, so their wings are being used to keep them above God, okay? Um, they're covering, protecting the glory and the holiness and the presence of God. Two of them are covering their face. Now, why would they do that? This is a problem that I don't think enough people have a problem with. People don't see the problem here. What did God tell Moses? If you look on me, you will surely die. This is a theme that's picked up with John in John's Gospel, where he talks, he's alluding directly to Exodus 33 and 34, where Moses is saying that, and he alludes directly to that, and, and he says um, that no man has ever seen God. You, you can't see God, right? And yet, Moses is allowed to get a glimpse of him from behind the rock. And in the same way, we get to see God in the person of Jesus Christ. It is the rev he is the revelation of God. That's what John is linking to that. So there's a sense in which humanity, right, can't see God. Was it always that way? Adam and Eve dwelt in the Garden of Eden and they walked with God. They were naked and they were what? Not ashamed. There was no shame. They were there with God. There they are, Adam and Eve. They're in the presence of God and there's no indication that they shouldn't be in the presence of God. Right? So why is it then and this isn't a trick question, this is an easy question. Why is it then that Moses is told you can't see God? Why is it no man's seen God? Why is it that we cannot see the glory and the presence and the brilliance of God? Because of what happens to Adam and Eve. Sin. And then God comes out in the garden and he says, hey, why are you hiding? We are hid because we were naked and what? Ashamed. And so what does God do? He first thing he does is he covers their nakedness. It's all about the fall. Now, this, this, this gets very interesting. Because why then would holy angels, and we're going to come back to the fall in a minute, but why would holy angels need to cover their face? Why could they not look on God? Or, 
Am I somehow reading into this too much? What, what, they, don't cover, they don't need to cover themselves from God. People would say, these are holy angels. Angels can't fall. They're, they're holy. The fall's happened. It's all done. Angels are holy. They can't fall. They're perfect in all their ways and what have you. And that's how they are. And so, you know, there's, there's probably some other reason for them covering themselves from the glory of God. They, they, could, they can be in the presence of God. But what about them covering their feet? Now, this is a little awkward. <laughs> I will deal with it as best I can. The, how do I explain this? Let me try it this way, okay? I've been thinking long and hard about how to communicate this politely. You know how we talk about the nails in Christ's hands, the nails piercing his hands hands. Yes, everyone's aware of that, right? And then you will get some well-meaning atheist scientist coming along and saying, well, you know, if you were to crucify somebody through their hands, then it would rip out because there's not enough there. And the answer, if you've never had the answer to that sort of problem that's presented, is that the crucifixion will be done through the wrist where the bones will be sufficient to hold. And the problem is, is that we, when we use our anatomical terminology, are very precise. This is a hand, a wrist is a separate from the hand, right? Yet in the Greek, the word translated hand not only encompasses the hand and the wrist, it can also include the fingers, which we would, which we would have perhaps distinct, but can even go all the way up to the forearm on occasion. It's just your lower arm and hand and that whole kind of area. They weren't quite as precise as we were with their daily use of these terms. I hope you kind of know where we're going now. When it comes to feet, feet can sometimes literally mean feet in the sense of the feet that bring the good news, the feet that travel, the feet that go, feet that move. But you see, your feet don't move, do they? If it was only your feet that moved, you go really, really slowly but you go a little faster because it's not just feet, there's actually legs. And in the same way, the Hebrew word here for feet can on occasion mean all of your lower extremities, from the end of your toes right the way up to your genitalia. You can see where I'm going with this. Sometimes, because they like to use euphemisms in Bible times, the word feet was used to speak of the nether regions. It was used to speak of the nether regions. And in fact, we, when you read scholars and academics on this particular topic, they will all agree that one of the surest, most obvious and definite examples of this is in the very next chapter of Isaiah. And in Isaiah, by the way, we've been talking about how chapters 1 through 5 lead up to chapter 6. In the same way, chapter 6 is the foundation for everything that follows. It's this kind of centerpiece in the beginning of Isaiah. So if something comes in chapter 7, it's really quite significant. And in chapter 7, and you're pretty much there, so you might as well have a look. But in chapter 7, there is this uh, judgment that is being spoken of. Um, let me get the, the, exact, uh, the exact reference to this. Um, verse 20. In that day, the Lord, notice that it's not Lord as in Yahweh, it's Lord as in little o and r and d, which is the same phrase that's used of Lord in chapter 6 and verse 1, which does two things. Firstly, it tells you it's talking about his might and his kingship rather than his personality. And secondly, it links you back to the throne room scene. Okay, so in that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet. So he's going to shave two parts, the head and the hair of the feet. The hair of the feet literally is the hair of the feet. Some versions will say the hair of the legs, meaning the whole of that region. But scholars looking at comparative texts, are unanimous in what this means. It means that it's shaving of his pubic hair. And the picture is this. You will be shamed by the shaving of your head publicly, and you'll be shaved in what can't be seen as well as in what can be seen. It's a picture of humiliation, if you like. And, and by the way, while we're talking about nakedness and humiliation and what have you, look at, look at go back one chapter before to chapter 5, uh, no, sorry, not a little bit more than that. Chapter 3, rather. In chapter 3, 
we had the whole section on the daughters of Zion. Do you remember that? The daughters of Zion who were being judged and accused, these women who were wives of these, of these bad leaders and how they abused their position. And in verse 16, the Yahweh says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Doesn't that suddenly look different, by the way? Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion. Hold it there. Am I reading too much into feet here? Tinkling with, <laughs> with their feet. And by the way, I'd like to go back and teach chapter 3 now because I didn't know this when I taught chapter 3. You know, the idea is oh, look, we're tinkling with our feet. It kind of has a very different implication now. It's kind of like, hey, look at me, guys. It's a very sexual imagery. Okay? And, and so... That's what they're doing in verse 16. And the judgments, verse 17, therefore the Lord, he's going to strike them, the heads of a daughter, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In other words, you think that your sexuality, you're going to put it out there, you're going to go and be sort of, you know, these, these immoral women. Will God, will, you like exposing your nakedness? God will expose your nakedness. Not in the sense of a sexual sense, but in the sense of a shame sense. Nakedness being linked with shame. And so there's all of this theme. So isn't this interesting? We have the link to feet in the future, one chapter further on, in this context. That's linked to chapter 6 through the reference of it's the Lord who's doing this in judgment. And in his judgment, he's shaving the pubic hair of this Assyrian. It's, it's an act of shame, okay? Then we go back and we have God exposing the nakedness of the women who've been tinkling their feet. I leave that to your imagination quite what that, that might mean. And so when we have feet here, feet in chapter 3, feet in chapter 7, when you have it here, I, you know, the nakedness in chapter 3, the nakedness in chapter 6, you put it all together. I find it very hard to think that this means, as some commentators have said, that they're covering their feet, meaning that they're not traveling and, you know, they're there in the presence of God, blah, blah. It's got nothing to do with feet in that sense. It's to do with the covering of nakedness. And I believe because of this, that this is alluding, this is pointing us to Genesis chapter 3. So let's go and have a look at Genesis chapter 3. I'm sorry, I'm going to probably leave you with more questions and answers tonight. But I think it's good to explore this stuff and to rid ourselves of the oversimplification of things that we maybe had in the past. So, after we have in chapter 3, the fall, which is done by a what? Serpent. Now, it's not the same word. It's not the word seraph. It's the other word, more common word for serpent, but we're still talking a serpent-type creature. Okay? Have you ever, by the way, wondered when you've read this text? I mean, if a serpent came up to you and said... Did God actually say to you, you should not eat of this tree? What does the woman say? She says, we may eat of the trees of the fruit of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of this fruit. Do you know what I'd say? Flipping heck, it's a talking snake. That's what I'd say. I mean, doesn't it strike you as strange? I mean, if we are people who believe in the word of God of being literal, if we don't think this is some sort of childlike story that is given in imagery, if we don't think that this is something that didn't actually happen, we don't think that it's just some story representing, but we think it's actual literal truth, does it not strike us as strange that Eve is not in the least bit surprised by a talking serpent? Why? Because they're happy being in the presence of God, and God in his presence is there with his heavenly host and his heavenly host includes angels and cherubim and seraphim who look like serpents i suggest to you tentatively that the seraphim would be creatures that eve and adam would have been familiar with because they were able to be in the presence of god and the whole point of eden is that God was in the heavens and God was bringing his dwelling place to earth along with the heavenly hosts. 
Now, that's not really what I want to point out to you. We've, this is just the background. We've got the fall, the serpent that's involved in the fall, a talking serpent that can communicate, okay? A talking serpent that can communicate, and there is this fall, and God judges them following the fall, because, looking back at verse 10, they're hiding from God. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Notice this, this holiness of God that was a thing that was of no concern to them now is something they're fearful of because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? It's the eating of the fruit and the bringing of sin that makes this nakedness a problem. Now they need to be covered up. And here's the part. This is the passage I think he's alluding to. You have the... the um, the condemnation, the judgment that God brings to Adam and to Eve in the curse that we know. Now let's look at the end of that in verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and he clothed them. So there we have in this passage the picture of the nakedness of man being covered up the nakedness of man the shame that they have because of their sin being covered up by blood and by death and God is the one who makes that okay now look what immediately follows then the Lord God said behold the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil if you were talking to many Jews, they will say the us is just like the royal we. The Queen in England, if she's asked, what did you do today, ma'am? We went for a ride in the carriage. That means I went for a ride in the carriage, but she's just very posh. So she says we. It's the royal we, you know. And, and many J Jews will simply say, well, Elohim is literally God's, and God is called Elohim because of his great majesty. And, and there, there is truth. It is used in that way. And, and so they will say that, let, let us. So what? You know, what are you saying, Jews? You're saying God's talking to himself? There's only one God. How can that be? So the Christian comes along and says, aha, I see the Trinity hidden away here in the Old Testament. And I don't think that's the case either. I think that when we look throughout Scripture, and we don't have time for it tonight, but Psalm 82, Psalm 89, here in Genesis 1, when God says we, God is talking about his heavenly host. Let us make man in our image. And he says here, behold, he's become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take fruit, hold of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So we have now in our picture, nakedness, heavenly host, like us. And now what do we see? He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim. Man is now unholy, and Eden, the dwelling place, the temple of God, the dwelling place of God on earth, the place where God and his heavenly host could be, man can no longer be there. And therefore, something that he saw previously that was not a problem, something that he recognized, Talking serpents, serpent-like creatures. Now those creatures, whether it's the serpent ones or others, some of those cherubim, seraphim creatures are now there with a flaming, that's fire again, sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Man has gone from being someone who can be in the presence of God to something that can no longer be in the presence of God. And why is Isaiah alluding to this? Because we have in Isaiah 6 a man who is unworthy coming into the presence of God. He is ashamed of his nakedness. Nakedness isn't mentioned of Isaiah specifically in other than him saying, woe is me, my lips are unclean. He knows he is unworthy, he is ashamed to be there. But the fascinating thing from my perspective is this overlooked thing that even the seraphim aren't worthy to be there. How is it that these holy beings, this is the question we haven't resolved yet, 
How is it that these beings that we presume to be holy, how is it that they have to cover their nakedness? How is it that they have to cover their face? You see, if you have a man in the presence of God, here's the glory of God. You want to cover your face because you can't see God and live. And you want to cover your nakedness because you're ashamed. There is, in the covering of the face and the covering of the lower part of the body, there is this picture of covering yourself, of needing to be covered in the presence of God because we are not worthy to be in his presence. But we don't think of angels in that way, do we? We don't think of the heavenly host in that way, do we? Maybe that's something we've gotten wrong. Turn with me to Job chapter 15. Job chapter 15. I'm going to give you a head start on this because I'm just turning to another passage as well, ready for straight afterwards. So, um, right, now I'll go to Job. Hopefully you're already there. It's just before the book of Psalms if you're struggling. Job 15. And verse uh, 14. What is man that he can be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he can be righteous? Okay. So, first of all, let's look at uh, verse 14. Man isn't pure and a woman's not righteous. Okay? That's clear. We, we are not worthy before God. And then he goes on to state something even more so. Behold, gold, uh, God puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. Now, a couple of things. You know how in uh, the New Testament, Paul uses terms like principalities and powers to speak of demonic beings? Well, the angelic realm, fallen or otherwise, are used in such terms. And often the term the heavens does refer to the heavenly beings, the ones of the heavens, if you want to be more literal. And this is very typical um, Jewish um, parallelism. He puts no trust in his holy ones, the heavens are not pure in his sight. So the holy ones in the heavens are the same thing here. The holy ones are the angelic beings, and the heavens are the angelic beings, and God does not trust them because they're not pure. Therefore, verse 16, how much less one who is uh, 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 abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. In other words, if God can't trust the angelic beings, if they're not pure, if God can't trust them, he can't, you can't trust man. How much? Because man's less than them, right? That's the whole argument. Um, so... And just, uh, I don't have to, you have to turn there, but just to uh, parallel, in Deuteronomy 32, it says, Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods. And gods, we know, is routinely used of angelic beings. And again, the same parallelism. The gods are the heavens, they are to rejoice and to bow down before him. Rejoice with him and bow down before him. Very typical sort of Hebrew structure. So the picture being painted is one that we're perhaps not familiar with which is one where angels, angelic beings, the heavenly host, the cherubim and the seraphim, aren't trustable. They're not incorruptible. We've always been taught that um, the angels fell, those who fell became demons, and that's it, it's done. Now there's a line drawn in the sand and angels can't fall anymore. I don't know the answer. I've literally just started researching this this week, and I wish I had another year to prepare this sermon because there's so much more I need to look at. But I will say this, I'm now really open to the possibility that when, when we're told in Job 15 that God can't trust the angels, that there is perhaps the potential for angels to fall again. Perhaps. We don't know. There's so much that we've presumed one way. I'm not saying we should presume the other way. I'm just saying maybe we should stop presuming and just be open to different options. 
So all of this then kind of makes us say, okay, so hold on a minute. If the angels aren't completely perfect, if there's, if there's something that's not complete in them, they can't stand in the presence of God, how come Adam and Eve could be in the presence of God before the fall? Well, we've done this, guys, in our studies in Hebrews in the mornings. Turn with me back to Hebrews 2. So Hebrews 2, um, if you recall, those of you who were there when we, when we did it, it quoted from Psalm 8, so I'm just getting myself to Psalm 8 ready as well. But it says, it was not angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. So it was not two angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we're speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor, putting in everything in subjection under his feet. Now, we obviously look at Psalm 8 now in the light of Christ, who under, who, under whose feet all things will be subjected. He will be the sovereign over all. He is, I believe, the Lord on the throne in Isaiah 6.1. And we see that and we think, that, oh, that's just speaking of Christ. But when we did, if you recall, when we did um, Hebrews 2, we looked at this in context. And it was talking about the majesty of God. And it says, and, I, and I'm reading now from Psalm 8, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful for him? and the son of man that you care for him. Now, I want you to understand the context that this is found in. The context that this is, how come you think so much of man? Why, why, why are you treating man so special? Why are you blessing man? Why, why is man this big deal to you, God? It's in the context of, I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars. Do you know another name, another word that is used to refer to angels in the Bible? The word star. So heavens is used to describe the angelic beings and stars used to describe the angelic beings. The idea is you look at the stars up in the heavens and what they are physically in, the, in, in what we call space represents what the angels are in the next heaven, the third heaven beyond the, the place, dwelling place of God, which is how they kind of viewed it. So it, it's being spoken of in the t context of a God's creation, but also in the context of, of the angelic hosts. And therefore, he naturally goes on to talk about angelic hosts. He says, yet you have made him, that's mankind, a little lower than the heavenly beings. And literally, for a little while, and crowned him with glory and honor. And the way that the Jews, and I remember saying this in Hebrews too, the Jews understood this, is that man was created and then became lower than the angels for a little while because of the fall. The implication is, is that man wasn't, man wasn't always below the angels, but man was created greater than the angels. That God created man at the pinnacle of creation, right? Now, we're out of time, and I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to throw out to you a suggestion. And it's only a suggestion, and it's fun, and it's tentative, and what have you, but the fact is we don't have that much information. And I could try and argue my case on this. That would be another whole sermon. And maybe next week, I don't know, I'll think about it, but probably not. I want to keep in Isaiah. But consider this. When God created Satan, and if you were here for Arnold teaching through the six abodes of Satan a few weeks ago, Satan was the greatest of all created beings. He was the most beautiful, the most wise. He was the greatest of all created beings. And yet, he was an angelic being. And yet... Man is above the angels before the fall. So how can that be, be true? The answer is it's true if you think of it chronologically. Satan was the greatest of God's created beings. He was the greatest of the angelic beings. And then man came along. When did the fall of Satan happen? We don't know. We know that it happened at some point. We know that when he was created, he was good, right? 
So we know that initially he was good. We know that at some point he fell. We know, the only time we know for certain that he'd fallen is in the Garden of Eden. At that point he's fallen, right? Hey, for all we know, that could be the fall of Satan. So, we know that there's a fallen Satan there in the Garden of Eden, but we don't know anything else before that. I suggest to you this, that God created the angelic realm and Satan was the greatest of them all. And Hebrews 2 tells us that God gave revelation to man, he had plans for man that, that he didn't have for the angels. That ma who, who's man that you're mindful of him, that you give him dominion? Dominion, everything under your feet. Yes, that's going to be ultimately fulfilled in Christ, but it was true in Genesis 1 because God says to, to man, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of that, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of that. Where was Satan's original dwelling place? It was in the presence of God. And then on the earth, you have the earth and you have those metallic realm, as it were, that is spoken of in Ezekiel 28. And you have Satan, and he wanted to be the most high. And isn't it interesting, the seraphim are above God in covering him, covering the glory. And Satan wanted to be above God in the other sense, in the sense of being high and lifted up above him. What could have provoked this pride? One possibility, and I suggested this to a friend of mine who's more scholarly than I, just to say, am I barking up the wrong tree here? And he said, oh, he says, no, that's not a new idea. The rabbis have taught that. So this has been thought before. But is it possible that the creation of man is what provokes Satan in jealousy to seek to be above God? Why would you give man this honor? You, you, you can't be trusted to do this. I need to be in charge so that I wouldn't do this, give this glory to man, put man in this place above. I'll show you how bad man is. And thus the fall. And it links all of these things together. So I don't know. The whole of the creation of Satan, fall of Satan. We know that he was described as a cherub. We know he's part of the cherubim seraphim realm. We know that in Genesis he's described as a serpent. We know that in Revelation at the end he's described as a serpent as well. We know that the, the, cherub, the seraphim are these fiery serpents and we know that they are doing a role that Satan was responsible originally for. We know that Satan fell and we know that he hates man. But in the context, and let's go back to where we should really be from all this excitement in Isaiah 6. In the context of all of this, the seraphim are these mighty, beautiful, wise, powerful, scary beings who even though they haven't fallen, have in the past, perhaps could again, they're kind of scary. God doesn't fully trust them, but they're there and they have a job to do. And the job is to keep the holiness of God clean from contamination. And Isaiah steps in and they're going to get him. But even they who protect the holiness of God are not worthy to be in his sight. They're there and they're allowed to be there. But here's the point. They have to cover their faces and they have to cover their nakedness. Isaiah, representative of man, who used to be higher than the angels, but has become lower than the angels, who through the fall has become uncleaned. Woe, I'm a man of unclean lips. The seraphim come, and rather than in their judgment destroying him, as we saw at the end of Isaiah 1, in their judgment they purify him. And then he can stand before God and say, here I am, send me. And look what he's not doing. He's not covering his face and he's not having to cover his nakedness. His lips are now clean. He represents the restoration of man who fell below the angels to be restored again. And guys, let me tell you something I do know. I've used the word tentative too many times tonight. So let me end with something I do know. When we have our glorified bodies and we spend eternity in the presence of our Lord, there will be no shame. 
there will be no need for us to be covered, to cover our faces, to hide away from God, because sin that lowered us has been dealt with and has been conquered. And we will be greater than even these angelic beings again. And we praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your, your majesty and your goodness. Lord, when we see these pictures, these, these pictures of you and your glory, may we be reminded of how majestic you are. Isaiah was able to just go about his life, do his things, be part of Israel, and then he sees you, and he sees who you are, and woe is me. I'm not fit to be in this place. I'm uncovered, I'm ashamed. And Lord, we go about our lives and we're distracted and we forget your majesty. We walk about proud and lifted up, thinking more of ourselves than we ought. Father, may this picture of you in your glory remind us of your majesty. And may we bow before that majesty. But Lord, may we also be reminded that there's a majesty that we will one day be able to dwell in because of the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.